money is the sinews of war. While these words have always rung true from the campaigns of Augustus and Gaul or the Russo-Ukrainian War, on this particular occasion, these words were spoken in 1910 by President William Howard Taft while addressing a crowd at a synagogue in Washington, D.C. Taft spoke in support of a proposal put forth by American Hebrew, a popular Jewish newspaper, to raise a statue to the Jew who stood by Robert Morris and financed the American Revolution. That man's name was Chaim Solomon, and it's his story that we'll be looking at today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Chaim Solomon was born on April 7, 1740, in Lesno, Poland. We don't know the names of his parents. Still, we do know they were Sephardic Jews, a Jewish diaspora that had emigrated from the Iberian Peninsula after the 1492 Edict of Expulsion that forced all practicing Jews to relocate from the recently, quote, liberated Spain. For a man who played such an essential role in bankrolling the Revolutionary War, we know very little about Chaim's early life. We do know he was well-educated and spent much of his early life traveling across Europe, learning several languages along the way. He was fluent in Polish, German, French, and English, just to name a few. We'll never know what the young Chaim did in Europe, but one thing is certain. The bright and ambitious young man developed an impressive mind for everything financial. In the aftermath of the first partition of Poland, Chaim left his homeland in the 1770s and abandoned the old world for the new. He arrived in New York City in either 1772 or 1775. The evidence isn't very conclusive. The first concrete evidence of Solomon in New York City is a document that lists a Chaim Solomon the Distiller as a translator for a Frenchman speaking with the New York Provisional Assembly in 1776. It's very likely that Chaim, alone and penniless in a new nation, did find work as a distiller. American breweries were in dire need of experienced European laborers to produce domestic alcohol. At some point before New York was occupied by the British in September of that year, Chaim, sympathetic to the revolutionary cause, his own nation being subjugated and divided by larger powers, joined the Sons of Liberty. Shortly after the British arrival in New York, he was arrested and convicted as a spy. The British, though, needed interpreters for their Hessian allies. Chaim was pardoned to serve in that capacity at the insistence of New York's Jewish community and the Hessian general, Leopold Philipp de Heister. At some point during his parole, he would marry 15-year-old Rachel Franks. The 21-year age difference was not uncommon at the time to solidify business ties between the families. One source claims they married on July 6, 1777, but we don't have corroboration. The couple would go on to have four children. Despite working as a translator to the Hessian forces, Chaim was also permitted to found and manage his own business. He primarily worked as a merchant, selling provisions to ships that were departing the city. While helping the Hessians, Chaim covertly helped American and French prisoners escape British captivity. He also regularly tried to convince Hessian troops to abandon the British cause and either go home or defect to the Patriots. We don't know how much success he saw in either of those efforts. Chaim was also tied to Hercules Mulligan's espionage ring. We don't know precisely the extent of their operations. Still, as we explained in our video covering Cato Howe, Chaim would visit Mulligan's tailor shop to translate advertisements for the Hessian officers. While there, he would pass along vital intelligence to be smuggled out of the city. The British authorities rightly began suspecting Chaim of spying for the revolutionaries again, arresting him in 1778. From what we can gather, he was implicated in a plot to set fire to British ships in New York Harbor 
he was found guilty and sentenced to death. But before his execution could take place, Haim managed to flee the city. We have no idea how he escaped. We know that two weeks after fleeing New York City, he arrived in the nation, nation's capital, Philadelphia, though, contrary to some sources, he was forced to leave behind his wife and newborn son, Ezekiel. Ezekiel was born just one week before Haim was forced to flee for his life. Once again penniless, by February 1781, he was a successful financial broker, mainly by negotiating the sale of bills of exchange. A bill of exchange was effectively a promissory note, more or less a written agreement that one party agrees to pay another party by a specified time. Haim, as the broker, would ensure the transfer of the funds within the specified time frame for a small fee. Haim also worked directly with the French consul in Philadelphia, helping procure supplies for French troops in Pennsylvania. It's about this time that Haim formed a lifelong bond with two Polish officers serving in the Continental Army. The combat engineer Tadeusz Koszczałko and the dashing cavalry commander Casimir Pulaski. As we know, on June 27, 1781, Robert Morris accepted the position of superintendent of finance at the behest of Congress. Morris desperately needed to convert foreign bills of exchange into cash so they could be used to purchase badly needed supplies for the Patriots. He hired Solomon to oversee this process and distribute the funds, in large part due to his multilingualism. In facilitating these transactions, Chaim donated whatever personal profit he got directly into the Bank of North America in an effort to jumpstart the institution. In addition to his official duties as Morris's deputy, Chaim continued his private brokerage, working to procure supplies for the Continental Army. Throughout the war, Chaim worked tirelessly to fundraise money for the Continental Army. He raised over $650,000 for the cause, that's about $16 million in today's money. His most important contribution, though, came when he and Morris directly financed the Yorktown expedition in the fall of 1781. That victory at Yorktown would have been impossible without the $20,000 donated directly by Solomon. After that decisive victory at the Battle of Yorktown, the newly formed United States of America was left in an even more precarious economic position. Foreign credit had dried up. Neither Solomon or Morris could afford any longer to personally bankroll the army, and bills of exchange were few and far between. Solomon, under orders from Morris, sold what few bills of exchange were left to pay the troops. Throughout all of this, we need to remember that Chaim's wealth was nothing compared to more established merchants, such as Morris, William Bingham, and John Ross, who had built their fortunes before the war began. Nonetheless, Chaim donated all his profit back into the coffers of war, something Morris, Bingham, Ross, or any other merchant never did. It's ironic, then, that rivals of Morris and Chaim's Bank of North America often accused Chaim of charging an exorbitant transaction fee, whereas most brokers took a 2 to 5% commission on any transaction they oversaw, Chaim took just a 0.5% commission and donated most of what he earned back to the cause. In the Pennsylvania press, a brief but intense war was fought between Morris and Chaim and Mears Fisher, their economic opponent. Mears accused Chaim, Morris, and others of unduly profiting off the Bank of North America, in his words, committing typical Jewish broker's usury. While Chaim and Morris would successfully parry those anti-Semitic attacks, the press campaign attracted much attention to Chaim's religious beliefs. His character, his loyalty, were constantly being questioned. These attacks gained further steam when Chaim was a founding member of the Congregation Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia, making the most significant individual donation to the new synagogue's construction. Chaim served Morris and the Revolution faithfully as Deputy Superintendent of Finance until Morris resigned on November 1st, 1784. 
After the war, Chaim tried to restart his business ventures, often without much success. Almost all of his wealth was locked up in worthless government currency and bills of exchange. At the time of his death, he held $353,000 in continental money and bills of exchange, but they were only worth 10 cents on the dollar. Before his death, Chaim Solomon played a pivotal role in challenging the religiously mandated oath required for all government officials in Pennsylvania. After the oath was overturned at the behest of Robert Morris in 1784, Solomon issued a rebuttal against anti-Semitic diatribes. He said, quote, I am a Jew. It is my own nation. I do not despair that we shall obtain every other privilege that we aspire to enjoy along with our fellow citizens. While he was an ardent American patriot, he also believed the United States lacked opportunities for Jews. He wrote his family after the revolution not to join him in America. He sent what little money he could spare back to his family in Poland. He died unexpectedly on January 8, 1785, in Philadelphia, at the age of 44. He and his family were in poverty. After all his assets were evaluated, it was determined he was $560 in debt. The Bank of North America liquidated that debt on Solomon's behalf. In the end, all Chaim Solomon could leave his wife and four children were some furniture. He didn't even have enough money left to pay for a headstone. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the Mikvah Israel Cemetery in Philadelphia. Chaim's memory has been both contested and complex. Generations of his descendants fought tirelessly to receive the compensation they felt they were owed from Congress, but those efforts ultimately were in vain. In 1893, Congress rejected a recommendation to strike a gold medal in honor of Solomon's contributions to winning American independence. Whether this rejection was due to his family's incessant requests for repayment or underlying anti-Semitism is unknown. Taft's desire to see a statue of Chaim built in Washington, D.C. would not come to fruition. During the 1920s and 1930s, Chaim's legacy was a point of contention both within and outside the Jewish community. Some in both camps called for Chaim's memorialization. Others said it seems utterly ridiculous and absurd. While it might seem that quote came from an anti-Semitic Jew hater, that actually came from Louis Marshall, the president of the American Jewish Committee, the leading Jewish advocacy group in the United States. The AJC was afraid of awakening the latent anti-Semitism lying dormant in many Americans. It would be that fear that paralyzed the AJC's efforts 25 years later as the Nazis systematically eradicated Europe's Jews. As during Chaim's time, Americans were concerned about the dual loyalty of many Jews. Were they indeed Americans? Were they Israelites? Where did their loyalties truly lie? A statue was ultimately unveiled in Chicago at the corner of Wacker Drive and Wabash Avenue. The Herald Square Monument, as it's known, depicts George Washington flanked by Robert Morris to his left and Chaim Solomon to his right. The statue was dedicated eight days after Pearl Harbor on December 15, 1941. Below the three men are emblazoned the words Washington delivered at a Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island in 1790. The government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. A noble sentiment, to be sure, but as we all know, America has continued to deal with intolerance. The deadliest attack on the Jewish community in the United States occurred on October 27, 2018, in Chaim's home state of Pennsylvania. Eleven people were killed and six were wounded by a man who believed that Jews were the children of Satan. As tragic as such senseless violence is, we must remember that hatred need not rear its ugly head at the point of a gun or by anti-Semitic symbols crudely spray-painted on a wall in the dead of the night. 
About 19% of Americans still believe that Jews co-control Wall Street. During the Second World War, a Liberty ship was christened the Chaim Solomon in his honor. He was also honored with a stamp in the Contributors to the Cause collection for the Bicentennial Celebration of the U.S. in 1975. In 1980, a marker was placed in the Mikvah Israel Congregational Cemetery in honor of Solomon and his contributions to both of his nations. Chaim's story is not only a tale of sacrifice, revolution, and freedom, it also serves as a testament to how far this country has made it since his death, and also of how far we still need to go. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, one of the most colorful generals of the Continental Army, Mad Anthony Wayne.